All right, let's open with prayer. Father, uh, we just thank you so much for your Torah. We thank you so much for your word and everything that you're doing in the world today. We just praise you and worship you when we pray that, uh, Lord, tonight that we would have ears to hear uh, what you're saying. In Yeshua's name, amen. Okay, a couple of uh, real quick announcements. Some of the exciting things happening next month, we also have historic events. Uh, it's on July 3rd, which is Tuesday of this year, is when the sun stood still for Joshua. Uh, two days later on July 7th is Ezekiel 1-1, when Ezekiel got the vision of God's glory. Uh, on July 11th, uh, that's when the famine prevailed in Jerusalem. Uh, and then uh, the Shabbat, July 16th, we're going to have Frank Seekins here again on Saturday. Uh, and then Tuesday the 19th is the Fast of Tammuz. That's when they worship the Golden Calf. It begins the Dire Straits for three weeks. Uh, and then on Monday night, uh, Jeremy Gimpel and Ari Abramowitz will be here for Tuesday Night Live. So that'll be a lot of fun. In August, we're going to be having this uh, event uh, teaching on replacement theology and watching a video presentation of the forgotten people, Christianity and the Holocaust. That's coming up uh, in August. So anyway, those are some of the announcements of things that are going on. Plus a reminder, we do have the biblical calendars available for the next year, starting this September. Okay, with that said, we are now going to jump into our lesson. To me, this is going to be a very exciting lesson. I think you're all going to love it tonight. It's called Rejoicing in Our Heritage. And why do I say heritage over inheritance? I'm going to say inheritance as we go through. But what's the difference between an inheritance and a heritage? Okay, uh, there's some mistranslations. Some better English words would have been better than inheritance. An inheritance, when you get it, you can give it away. Your heritage can't be given away. And so that's the, the big difference between the two. And so I have rejoicing in our heritage, but it's also, in one sense, your inheritance as well. But the thing that we'll be looking at is how we need to return to it and we need to embrace it. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, let's begin there. And let's go ahead and put up the first picture on the front here. Look at Matthew 7:24. It says, therefore, whoever hears these things of mine and does them, I will liken him a wise man who built his house upon a what? What happens to someone who does not build upon a rock their house? It's going to fall. Look at Isaiah 28, 16. It says, therefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I'm laying in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Now, do you believe God is wise and when he builds something, he's going to build it on a rock? Okay, he, he not only is going to build on a rock, he, he laid a chief cornerstone. And one of the things that we know is uh, this is like bedrock. Okay, this is something that you would want to build your house upon. Well, the very foundation of our faith you're going to find is in who? All right, you guys can read that. Good beginning Hebrew here. <clears throat> and it is built upon a relationship to the scriptures of Israel. It's built on a relationship to the land of Israel, and it's based on a relationship to the people of Israel, the Jewish people. So this is the foundation of, of what we have. This is what everything is being built on. It's built on the Lord who is the bedrock, but it's based on the scriptures of Israel, the land of Israel, the people of Israel. And so what we're gonna look at tonight is what is in the process going on right now prophetically from two different books of the Bible. How many of you believe that Everything in the Old Testament has not been fulfilled yet. There's still prophecies yet to be fulfilled, right? How many of you like to study prophecy? All right, we're going to look at that tonight. Uh, in Zechariah chapter 8, it speaks of a promised return that we'll be looking at later. But we're going to start in Deuteronomy 30, where there are three prophetic returns for the Jewish people that are in the process of happening right now in the day that we live. So it's kind of interesting when we look at a book that was written 3,500 years ago and it speaks clearly to today's time. I mean, who else can write a book like that but God? The three returns that they talk about in Deuteronomy 30, if you remember, the Song of Moses begins right around there. Uh, and in chapters like 26 through 28 is all the blessings and the cursings if they disobey and if they obey. And in Deuteronomy 30, it mentions three very prophetic returns for the Jewish people. The first one is they're going to return to the Lord. 
The second one is they're going to return to the land. The third one is they're going to return to the covenant. Now, what's interesting is in Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Now, how many of you know and realize in Acts chapter 3, the Lord had already risen from the dead. He's also already ascended to heaven. Very important to realize the chronology here. When this is written, Jesus had already risen from the dead. He's already sitting up in heaven. And so now look at what it says. Peter says, repent or return, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And look at this, and he shall send Jesus Christ. So is he talking about the first coming or the second coming? He's talking about the second coming here, because he'd already come and gone. And he says, he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached to you, whom the heavens must receive or hold on to until the times of the restitution of all things. This goes back to Deuteronomy 30, referring to these three returns. These are part of the restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since when? Okay, he's going back to the very beginning here. There are things that have not been fulfilled yet. This verse is telling you there are things prophetically that have not been fulfilled, and Jesus is not coming back until they are fulfilled. And so as uh, believers and, and as Christians around the world, if we don't know what, these, what prophecies haven't been fulfilled, then how can you think Jesus is going to return? You can't. He's not until these things are fulfilled. So let's take a look at them. The first one we'll put up here. What is that? Okay, the Tetragrammaton, the name of God. The first return we're going to talk about is a return to the Lord. The, the word for return and repent is somewhat synonymous. It's uh, the word shuv. And it's mentioned eight times just in Deuteronomy 30 how they need to return, they need to repent, eight times in Deuteronomy 30. What we're going to look at first is who is going to return to the Lord. Well, I can tell you right now, is referring to the Jewish people returning to the Lord. And so in Deuteronomy 30, verse 1 and 2, after we read all the curses and the blessings in 26 through 29, it says, And it shall come to pass, when all these things are come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you shall call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you, and you are going to return to the Lord, your God. You're going to obey his voice according to all that I command you this day, you and your children with all your heart, with all your soul. Now, I'm going to emphasize this uh, a little bit more later, but I want you to notice. Now, ha has this happened yet? Okay. When it does happen, what does it say? They're going to obey God's voice according to what he commanded them back then. Did you catch that? We're going to say it again here in a little bit. We're going to look at the time of the return. This is the time of the return is when all the curses have fallen as well as the blessings. How many of you realize the curses have fallen upon Israel quite vehemently over the last couple thousand years? But look at this. This is to Abraham God prophesied. God told Abraham when he put him under, so to speak, or right before he did, he says in Genesis 15, verse 14 through 16, and also that nation whom they shall serve, will I judge? And afterward, shall they come out with what? Great substance. And you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age, but in the fourth generation, they shall come here again. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Now, here's what's interesting. We know that refers to Egypt. And they did return, and they came out with great substance. But if you remember, the Hebrew mindset is what? Circular. This is going to happen again and again and again. And what I think is interesting is when you think of fourth generation, I can't help but think of 4,000 years, they're going to return. And do you realize it's been 4,000 years since Abraham? And so this is the, also, if you look at a generation, it's 1,000 years. Very interesting. But the other thing is, what I thought was um, amazing God said, you can't go there yet because I'm not done judging the Amorites. Their iniquity is not yet full. Well, I think what's also interesting is the iniquity of Israel was not yet full either. And so that's why they couldn't return. But let's look at a parallel prophecy here. First off, you know, it did mention Israel was going to be punished seven times more. Uh, and then seven times more and then seven times more. And so all of that has been taking place. But what we find at the time of the return is when all of a sudden they recall to mind all the promised consequences of disobedience. They're going to go, oh my goodness, I now remember. Well, there's going to be a parallel prophecy. I want you to look at the nature of their return. 
Okay, we see the prophecy to Abraham was fulfilled, right? They're on their way out of Egypt when Moses is speaking to them in Deuteronomy 30, okay? For, you know, for uh, the fourth generation's gone by, they've left Egypt, and look what it says. And you're gonna see how this was repeat, is gonna be repeated. It says in Deuteronomy 30, verse three through six, that then the Lord your God will turn your captivity and they're thinking, well, wait a minute. What do you mean turn our captivity? We just got out of captivity. And, and we were all at least together in Egypt, but, but we're going to have to go into captivity again? You mean you just delivered us, and you're trying to tell us we're about to go back into captivity again someday? Look at what it says. God says, I'm going to have compassion upon you, and I'm going to return and gather you from all the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. If any of you be driven out to the outmost parts of heaven... From there will the Lord your God gather you. From there will he fetch you. And the Lord your God will bring you into the land which your fathers possessed. Very important principle. And you're going to possess it. And then it says God's going to do you good. He's going to multiply you above your fathers. And the Lord your God is going to circumcise your heart, the heart of your seed, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live. So in other words, that cycle of going into Egypt that he told Abraham and coming out with great abundance, guess what? They're going to go back into captivity again, and then God is saying, and then I'm going to bring you back out again, and you're going to return with great abundance again. But it's hard to imagine another captivity that they were probably thinking. And then they're probably thinking, what? At least we were all together in Egypt, but now you're telling me not only are we going to go into captivity, we're going to be scattered all over the world. Now think about that. I mean, don't, with family, don't you think if you're all going to be scattered, don't you at least want to be together? Well, look what happened. <laughs> But here's the thing, a physical return really precedes a spiritual return. And so we're going to look at this next one. This next one is a restoration to the land. That's the next return that it talks about in Deuteronomy 30 that's prophesied. <clears throat> the fact that the Jewish people were dispersed throughout all the earth shows their covenant with God is still intact. Okay, because they were cursed does not mean they're not they're out of covenant. They're cursed because they are in covenant. Does that make sense? Okay. But there's a spiritual return that's coming as well. We already saw them return to the land, right? In 1948. But that they came in unbelief. Now there's going to be a spiritual return. And the other thing was when they return to the land is to the land of their fathers, not to Argentina. Not to Great Britain, not to America. God says, I'm going to return you to the land of your fathers, which is part of the prophecy that is happening now. Look at Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 21 through 31. It talks about this prophetically of what is going to happen. And it says, God is speaking here. And he said, I had pity for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen where they went. Now, think about this. He's going to say this over and over. How did Israel profane God's name in all the countries where they went? Why and how was his name profaned? Just, just kind of think about that for a minute as, we, as this unfolds. And God says, therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, I'm not going to do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my own holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the heathen, where you went. And I will sanctify my great name, which you have profaned among the heathen. Okay, which you have profaned in the midst of them. You got the message yet? Okay. But you know why? You know how his name is profaned? Because all the nations are saying basically, hmm, remember what did Moses say? If you don't bring them in and you kill them all, they're going to say you're not able, God. So all the, all the world is, are they saying, hey, God, you can't do it. But let's look how this unfolds. He says, but when God does this, it says, the heathen will know that I'm the Lord, says the Lord God, when I will be sanctified in you before their eyes. And how is he going to be sanctified? He says, because I'm going to grab you by the shirt collar and I'm going to take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all the countries and bring you into your own land. What's amazing is they have their own land, but they don't want to go. And that's what's happening today. Half the Jews of the world aren't in their land. And it's their land. And so God's going to take them by the scruff of the collar and haul them over there. And it says, then, look at this, then will I sprinkle clean water upon you. 
Okay, so they come in unbelief first, which is what happened in 48. And then sometime after, he's going to sprinkle clean water on them and they'll be clean from all your filthiness, from all your idols. I will cleanse you. And then look, it's time for heart surgery. He says, a new heart will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh. I'll give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them. And you will dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. You'll be my people. I'll be your God. I'm also going to save you from all your uncleanness. I will call for the corn and will increase it. I'll lay no famine upon you. I'm going to multiply the fruit of the tree and increase of the field that you receive no more reproach of famine among the heathen. And then you shall remember. Look at this. And then you shall remember your own evil ways, your doings that were not good. You'll loathe yourself in your own sight for your iniquities and for your abominations. Now, the question is this, why would they go into captivity? Why was this prophecy here in Deuteronomy fulfilled and the Jewish people were scattered all over the earth for the last 2,000 years? If you were to ask a typical Christian, how come the Jews have been scattered all over the earth for the last 2,000 years, what's going to be their answer? Because they killed my Jesus. Isn't that right? You ask any Christian why the Jews have been scattered for the last 2,000 years, it's going to be because they killed my Jesus. Well, you know what's interesting? Let's look at what the Bible says. Let's go back to Deuteronomy 29, verse 22 through 28. It says, so that the generation to come, the word there is akaron. It means the last generation, the terminal generation. This is it, this last generation before Messiah comes of your children that are going to rise up after you and the stranger that will come from a far land shall say, when they see the plagues of that land, the sicknesses which the Lord has laid upon it, the whole land thereof is brimstone, salt, burning, that it is not sown, nor bears, nor any grass that grows there, like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, these other two places. <clears throat> you know what's amazing? Mark Twain, when he went there in the late 1800s, he says, this place is just barren. There ain't nothing here. Who'd want to live here? This place is horrible. Adma and Zeboim, which the Lord overthrew in his anger and in his wrath, even all the nations are going to say, why has the Lord done this to this land? Which, what means the heat of his great anger? And then men are going to say, it's because they forsaken the covenant of the Lord God of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. He threw them out, not because they rejected the new covenant. He rejected them and kicked them out because they rejected the Torah. So for the last 2000 years, they've been scattered, not because they rejected Yeshua. They've been scattered because they rejected Torah. That's what this is saying right here. They went and served other gods and worshipped them, gods whom they knew not, whom he had not given to them. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against this land to bring upon it all the curses that were written in this book. And the Lord rooted them out of their land in anger, in wrath, in great indignation, and cast them into another land as it is this day. Okay, so it's not because God was not able, and the text does not say all these things would happen because they rejected Yeshua or the new covenant. They're constantly being... Um, kicked out of the land or exiled is because of their rejection of Torah. And the promised restoration is also, what do you see here? When you read this, it's totally based on God's grace and mercy. God, by his grace and mercy, is just going to grab them by the scuff of the neck and bring them there. And it's not because they're righteous or holy. It's because God is tired of having his name profaned among the heathen, saying he can't do it. And then what do we see? There's a restoration of compassion. <clears throat> in that verse where it says God will have compassion on you that I just read a little bit ago the word compassion there is racham which is in Genesis 29 31 I'll put up this nice little picture here I think you guys have seen before it says here in Genesis 29 31 when the Lord saw that Leah was hated he opened her womb the same word for womb is the same word for compassion in other words, God is going to have great, strong compassion for Israel, showing the strong parental tie that the Lord has to the Jewish people. This is important to think about it. The Lord is saying the Jewish people are, I'm like a parent to them. I gave birth to them. Now, how many of you, uh, I mean, how many of you sometimes get mad at your kids? But how many of you want some parent of another kid coming over talking to you about how bad your kid is? 
What do you do when some parent comes, uh, uh, someone else come, you know, they got a snotty nosed kid of their own and they come up and, and they start ragging on you about your kid. What, what, does your hackles kind of go up a little bit? What do you think happens? God is telling you the Jewish people are, are my kids from the womb. And when people come and they start bad mouthing all the Jewish people, what do you think that does to God's hackles? The other thing, it, it talks about the restoration of fortunes that they have. We've already read that. The soil is going to respond to them. All their wealth is going to be returned. Look what's happening. This is an amazing picture. How many of you remember, I think it was back in August of 2005, Gush Katif in the Gaza Strip. Man, the, look at all these. These are all of the different hot houses that they had here. And they were growing all these plants in abundance and everything. And then they willingly gave it away, gave it to the Palestinians who tore it all down and sold the metal for scrap. Uh, you know, I mean, this is, but the, I want you to see the ground has been producing fruitfully for Israel. It doesn't for other nations that try to come in and do it, but for Israel it does, and it has been. <clears throat> the next thing that they're going to return to, that you're going to see, they're going to return to the covenant of Torah. Look at Deuteronomy 30, verse 7 through 14, as we move on in Deuteronomy 30. It says, and the Lord your God is going to put all these curses now upon who? Not a good time to be an enemy of Israel. Think about all the curses that they've gone through over the last 2,000 years. And all those same curses will be condensed in a seven-year time frame. Remember God says measure for measure? So Israel had all these horrible punishments, but at least it's been spread out over 2,000 years. The nations are going to get experience at all in seven years. The same measure that now is not a good time to be their enemy. And it says, he's going to put all the curses on those that hate you and those that persecute you. And what are you going to do? You're going to return and you're going to obey the voice of the Lord. And look at this. You're going to do all of his commandments which I'm commanding you when? What? You're going to return and you're going to obey the Torah? You're going to follow the Torah? I thought that was done away with. How in the world can they do that? So how can Christians say the Torah is done away with when Jesus himself, who wrote the Torah, is the living Torah, is telling everyone, guess what? You're going to obey the Torah when I come back. Right there, that's what it says. This prophetically has not happened yet. And he says, you're going to do all the commandments which I'm commanding you today, not that I will command you 1,500 years later when Jesus comes. That's not what it says. And then it says, the Lord your God is going to make you plenteous in every work of your hand, the fruit of your body, the fruit of your cattle, the fruit of your land for good. The Lord will again rejoice over you for good as he rejoiced over your fathers. If you shall hearken to the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written right here in the Torah. If you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, for this is the commandment which I command you today. And now look, this is what Romans, I believe, chapter 10 is quoting. It's not hidden from you. It's not far off. It's not in heaven that you would say, who's going to go up and get to heaven and get it? That we may hear it and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who's going to go over the sea and get it and bring it to us that we can hear it and do it. But the word is nigh you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart that you may what? Not just believe it. Does it say that you may believe it? It says that you may do what? Do it. This is very prophetic. But here's the other thing. According to Ezekiel, God is going to make them into new creations. Isn't that what he said? I'm going to make you into a new creation, put a new heart and a new spirit within you. Why? So now you can do Torah. That was the reason why. It's what it says. To allow them to be able to follow Torah from their heart. And look at Micah chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. In the last days. How many believe we're in the last days? In the last days is going to come to pass. The mountain of the house of the Lord will be established in the very top of the mountains. It'll be exalted above the hills. The people are going to flow to it. Many nations are going to come. Many nations are going to come and they're going to say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us of his ways. We will walk in his paths for the Torah is going to be going out of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So what is Yeshua going to teach when he's here? Torah. Okay. So here's the temple and Torah is what is going to be going all around the world. Isaiah 2, 1 through 3 says the same thing. This is the word that Isaiah, the son of Amasoch, concerning Judah and Jerusalem. 
It'll come to pass in the last days. The mountain of the Lord's house will be established on the top of the mountains. It'll be exalted above the hills. All nations will flow to it. Many people will go and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He'll teach us his ways. We'll walk in his paths. For out of Zion will go the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So here you got two witnesses saying, in the last days, it's the Torah that's going to be taught by Yeshua from all the world. But you know what's interesting is the very next verse. Look what the next verse says. And he, the Messiah, will judge among the nations. He'll rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Well, you know what's amazing about that verse? At the United Nations, this is a statue in front of the United Nations where it has someone beating a sword, making it into a plowshare. And right here is the text. We shall beat swords into plowshares. But you know what's amazing? They don't have the verse before that says the Torah is going to be coming out of Jerusalem. That's what's going to cause that to happen. <laughs> they think we are going to do it by our works. But God says, no, I'm going to do it by having the Torah come out from Jerusalem. For the first time in centuries, it's this past generation that we're living in where there is finally a growing visible remnant of Jewish believers who are remaining faithful to Torah and they still believe in Yeshua. And think about this. This is where you come in. Do you realize this is a historic opportunity where we are the very generation that can be part of the very first fruits harvest going into the millennial reign, participating in learning Torah? You're the first fruits. As you jump into this, I mean, can you imagine first fruits, the presentation of the first fruits, and, and here everyone brings the first fruits, the best to the Lord. The first fruits is what gets offered. Prophetically, you guys are the first fruits that are learning this. You are who the first fruits Yeshua is going to be presenting. I mean, why would anyone not want to be part of the first fruits is beyond me. Okay, then the next thing. This is what's exciting. Well, here we have bedrock. We have Yeshua, the scriptures of Israel, the land of Israel, the Jewish people. Well, guess what? There's another return we're going to look at now. We just looked at returning to the Lord, returning to the land, right? Guess what? There's going to be a return of Gentile believers to Torah. Hey. Uh, that's what's prophesied in the next scripture. Let's look at Zechariah chapter 8, verse 20 through 23. And we're going to look at the, the redeemed. What does it say? Thus saith the Lord of hosts, it'll yet come to pass. There's going to come people, the inhabitants of many cities. And the inhabitants of one city are going to go to another city. And guess what they're going to say? Let us go speedily to pray before the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. And I'm going to go too. Yea, many people and strong nations are going to come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts in those days. It'll come to pass. Now let's go to this next clip here. Say so all these nations here. And what does it say is going to happen? Ten men will take hold out of all the languages of the nations. Even she'll take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, we want to go with you. We heard that God is with you. Now, here's the interesting thing. When you do the math, how many nations? 70 nations. If there's 10 men from every nation, that means not 10. Oh, first off, I want to mention this. See this guy here holding on where it says they'll hold on to the skirt of him that is a Jew? The word take hold in Hebrew is kazak which means with great strength and you're not going to let go for nothing. And when it says take hold, it's not a passive, oh, I'm going to hold this. <laughs> this is a, I'm holding on and I'm not letting go. And it says the skirt of him that is a Jew, the word skirt there is kanaf, which means the corner of the garment as I go back. That's what it's talking about. Now, just because I like to be ornery, I'm going to make this comment, but I don't really mean it. Kind of. <laughs> it says he will take the hold of the skirt of him that is a what? It doesn't say the skirt of him that is a Hebrew. It doesn't say the skirt of him that is an Israelite. It does not say the skirt of him that is one of the lost tribes. Amen. Okay. It says the skirt of him that is a Jew. Jew. Okay. Now, uh, personally, the reason why I say I don't really mean that is because I believe all the lost tribes are Jewish per se anyway. I'm just being sarcastic. Okay. But can you imagine a day 
coming when people from all over the world will go to Jerusalem and actually meet Yeshua himself, seeing him seated on his glorious throne. That's going to happen in our day. Here we have people from every language around the world wanting to have a Torah observant Jewish believer and Messiah to lead them. So when, when you look at that picture of take hold and this one guy is just holding on for dear life, this represents a real determination among non-Jews to grab a hold and not let go. They're determined to learn Torah. They're determined to participate in the life of the redeemed Jewish people. Now, how come non-Jews want to come? Because it says they see God is with them. And who is them? Well, it's not Orthodox Judaism, okay? But it is to the Torah faithful Jewish believers in Messiah Yeshua. For almost 2,000 years, there have been stumbling blocks in the way for the nations to come close to Israel because of anti-Semitism and anti-Torah theology. Zechariah is saying more than just Gentiles are going to have an attraction to Jewish people and Jewish things. Okay, what is he saying? In Jeremiah 16, 19, let me go ahead and go back to this clip. It's when it says 10 men from every nation, if there's 70 nations, that's really saying 700 people are going to be grabbing hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, take us. But in Jeremiah 16, 19, look at what it says. O Lord, my strength, my fortress, my refuge in the day of affliction, the Gentiles are going to come to you from the ends of the earth. And they're going to say, surely our fathers have inherited lies, vanity, and things wherein there is no profit. Now, about 520 B.C., E is when after the Babylonian captivity, 586, 587 BC, the temple was destroyed, 70 year captivity, the temple's being rebuilt. And so now Zechariah is living around 520 BC and he's trying to comfort Jerusalem. And so look what he says though, but this prophetically is still to come. In Zechariah 8, 1 through 5, it says again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, thus saith the Lord of hosts, I was jealous for Zion with great jealousy. I was jealous for her with great fury. Thus saith the Lord, I am returned to Zion. In other words, he already came once and he's coming back. And I will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem will be called a city of what? Truth. Believe me, that has not happened yet. And the mountain of the Lord of hosts in the holy mountain. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, there so yet be old men and old women dwelling in the streets of Jerusalem, every man with a staff in his hand for very age. And then it has this, I got this neat little picture here of all these kids playing in the streets of Jerusalem. And it says the streets of the city will be full of boys and girls playing in the streets. Can you imagine a day when Jerusalem is actually be called a city of truth? Zechariah 8 verse 12 through 17 goes on to say this. And again, it's just like what was prophesied earlier. Your seed will be prosperous, the vine will give her fruit, the ground will give her increase, the heavens will give their due. I'll cause the remnant of this people to possess all these things. It'll come to pass that as you were a curse among the heathen, O house of Judah and house of Israel, so will I save you and you will be a blessing. Fear not, but let your hands be strong. Take hold of this, Israel. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, just as I thought to punish you when your fathers provoked me to wrath, says the Lord of hosts, and I repented not, so again have I thought in these days to do well to Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Fear not. These are the things that you shall do. Speak every man the truth to his neighbor. Execute the judgment of truth and peace in your gates. Let none of you imagine evil in your heart against his neighbor. Love no false oath. For all these things are what I hate, says the Lord. And then look what it says in verse 18 and 19. And this is very prophetic. And if, if you're a student of prophecy and you don't know this verse, then you're missing out. It goes on to say, because this is all talking about future. It says, And the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, The fast of the fourth month, the fast of the fifth, the fast of the seventh, the fast of the tenth, will be to the house of Judah joy and gladness and cheerful feast. Therefore love the truth and peace. The word feast here is moed, appointed times. These fasts that are now fasts, and they've been fast for the last couple thousand years, God is saying something is going to happen on these days that is going to just rock the world. And they're going to be, instead of a day of weeping, they're going to be a day of rejoicing, cheerful feasts. Well, prophetically, that hasn't happened yet. So if you don't know when these days are, how are you going to know when the prophecy is fulfilled? Which is why we have the biblical calendar. So you can see 
when these things take place. And I'll have you know, the fast of the fourth month is the 17th of Tammuz, which is coming up this July 19th, which is why you want this calendar. This is when the dire straits begin. We uh, will have this on the web as well as a handout on Saturday so you can follow along. Who knows if this wouldn't be the year that this prophecy is fulfilled. Okay. Now, look at Exodus 15, 17. God says, you're going to bring them in. Remember, they said, you only brought us in here to kill us. But God says, here, I'm going to bring them in and I'm going to plant them in the mountain of your inheritance in the place, O Lord, which you have made for you to dwell in, in the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. I love this next verse. This is Amos 9, 13 through 15. And pray this verse, hold on to this verse. Look what it says. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord. The plowman will overtake the reaper, the treader of grapes, him that sows seed. The mountains will drop sweet wine. The hills will melt. And I will bring again the captivity of my people of Israel. And they'll build the waste cities, inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. They shall also make gardens and eat the fruit thereof. And I will what? And then it says upon their land, and they will no more be pulled up out of their land, which I've given them, saith the Lord God. All right. They're not going to get pulled up. God is saying, I'm going to plant them and they ain't moving this time. And Ezekiel 47, 22 and 23, it goes on to say it'll come to pass. You're going to divide it by lot, this land for a what? Inheritance. And the strangers that sojourn among you, which shall beget children among you, and they shall be unto you as born in the country among the children of Israel, they also get an inheritance. Can you imagine? You're going to get an inheritance uh, in the land of Israel, among the tribes of Israel, and it'll come to pass, and whatever tribe the stranger sojourns, that you shall give them his inheritance, saith the Lord God. That's exciting to me. Let's look at this next clip. So let's look at your inheritance. I mean, have, I mean, not that anyone wants your parents to pass away, but some, I mean, for me, I, I get the bills. <laughs> my parents don't have a lot of money, they got bills. But if you have some big inheritance that's coming, it's like, oh my goodness, you want, this is, this is your inheritance, right? Well, look at what it says. It says, um, Isaiah 56, 4 through 8. Thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbath and choose the things that please me, and they take hold of what? Okay. Those of you that take hold of Torah, even to them will I give in my house and within my walls a place and a name better than that of sons and daughters. I'll give them an everlasting name that will not be cut off. And then it says also the sons of the stranger who return to the Lord, they grab a hold of the Lord, okay? that join themselves to the Lord to serve him, to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone that keeps the Sabbath from polluting it and takes hold of my covenant. He's saying twice, grab a hold of the Torah. He says, even then will I bring to my holy mountain to make them joyful in my house of prayer. And guess what? Their burnt offerings, everything that you bring, it says, and their sacrifices will be accepted upon my altar for my house will be called a house of prayer. For all people, okay, everyone who takes a hold of the skirt of the Jew that comes part of their inheritance is going to be the God of Israel, the land of Israel, the Torah of Israel, Yeshua himself. It says, for all people, the Lord God, which gathers the outcasts of Israel, saith, yet will I gather others to him besides those that are gathered to him. Who's he talking about? Us. Deuteronomy 33, 4. Moses commanded us a Torah, even the inheritance of the congregation of Jacob. Do you realize the Torah is your inheritance? That's your inheritance. Why would you despise your inheritance? Why do people reject Torah? My goodness, that's your inheritance. Will you be as one of the spies who despise the land of their inheritance and despise your inheritance of Torah? Will God be pleased with that just as they despised his word and didn't want his land? Here are the 12 spies. God said, I'm going to give you this land. We don't want your land. We don't think you can give us your land. We want to go back to Egypt. Amos 3.3, 3, can two walk together, it says, except they be agreed? To be with Yeshua, listen to this, to be with Yeshua in the millennial reign, you're going to have to love Torah, love to live in Israel, because that's where he lives. Love the Jewish people, they're going to be there too. Okay, 
Deuteronomy 32, 9. But look at this. The Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is a lot of his inheritance. So we inherit the Torah of Israel, the land of Israel, the people of Israel grafted in. And what is the Lord's inheritance? The Jewish people. And how could you go up and say to the Lord, your inheritance, I despise what you, what you inherit. Christians should beware of trying to throw away God's inheritance, the Jewish people. Right. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for studying with us today. If you have any questions regarding the material discussed, please contact me at my email address. It's Pastor Mark at El Shaddai Ministries dot U.S. Be blessed and shalom.